Its official name was the DUKW. To the American GIs in World War II was the Duck. This ungainly lumbering truck would never hit the headlines or win any prizes for its looks, but it had a special talent which made it a vital part of the Allied amphibious victories from Omaha Beach to Iwo Jima. The duck could swim. Whenever there was water to cross, this machine did it. It crossed rivers. It ferried stores in harbor. It went to sea. It carried cargo. And it carried men. It did weightlifting and climbing. The only thing it couldn't do was fly though it tried. I don't see how you could knock the duck anywhere it is, because there's no place that duck's not good. I mean, it, there's no place you can put it that it won't work. To me, it was a marvelous vehicle. It was a pleasure to drive it. If you couldn't handle it, it could kill you. You hit the beach, you're glad to be on sand. Because <laughs> that ocean gets deep. And you say, come on, old girl, come on, come on, old girl. Come on, get going. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it could also save your life. You got the feeling you were kind of special because you were depended on by so many. Using archive film and color reconstructions, Battle Stations tells one of the most unlikely success stories of World War II. The story of the Duck Amphibian. Trying to land an army on a beach has always been one of the toughest military operations. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of luck to pull it off. During World War I, the British attempted to put an army ashore in Turkey and Gallipoli. It was a disaster. Casualties were appalling, with more than 23,000 killed and 88,000 wounded. After nine months of clinging to a few worthless strips of sand, the British withdrew. Gallipoli demonstrated that an amphibious assault is arguably the most difficult single operation of war. And it's particularly hard if you're coming in against a defended beach. You need some way to bridge the gap between the water and the land some amphibious assets which are going to help your people actually get ashore. In the late 1930s, special infantry landing craft were developed in America. But for landing supplies, the military really needed a machine that could climb out of the water and up the beach to safety before unloading its cargo. It sounded like a good idea. The only problem was, Nobody knew how to do it, and there was no great sense of urgency about finding a solution. In 1940, Germany unleashed its Blitzkrieg on Western Europe. America hoped to remain neutral, but the issue was decided by the Japanese, who dreamed of imperial expansion in the Pacific. On a quiet Sunday morning in December 1941, Marine Sergeant Arthur Wells was passing the time of day with a friend on board the battleship Pennsylvania at the American naval base in Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. We heard an explosion. Someone made the remark, well, that's just like the Army to hold gunnery practice on Sunday. And uh, someone else yelled, the Japs are attacking. From his battle station high on the mainmast, Arthur Wells watched as wave after wave of Japanese torpedo planes launched their low-level attack. I could see into the cockpits, I could see the expression on the Japanese pilot's faces, and I could see the instrument panels, and then when they'd pull out, well, then I was literally eyeball to eyeball with the rear gunners. And I watched the Oklahoma roll over. Uh, watch from West Virginia get the side to torn out of her. Uh, torpedo after torpedo hit her. The 
So uh, all we could do was just watch. The Japanese attack on its Pacific fleet instantly catapulted America into World War II. Most Americans wanted to avenge the victims of Pearl Harbor. But Japan was allied with Adolf Hitler's Germany, which meant America would also have to fight a European war. The British and American allies took stock of the situation. To defeat Hitler would mean invading North Africa and mainland Europe. Germany's fascist ally Italy would also have to be attacked. A whole series of invasions would be needed to dislodge the Japanese from the island chains of the Pacific. And all these territories would have to be taken from the sea. It would mean an increasingly important role for America's elite force of seaborne soldiers, the U.S. Marines. On street corners throughout the United States, colorful posters beckon young men to the adventure, romance, and opportunity of the Marine Corps. I saw a picture of the Marines in the blue uniform in a drugstore, about normal tall, and I fell in love with the uniform, and that was it. I knew nothing about the Marines. And the section of the country I came from, of course, their jobs were very few. In fact, the matter, I got a dollar a month raise when I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> well, I grew up on a farm in eastern Colorado, and, and uh, we were pretty much at home. Then we saw this big billboard that said they need another good man, and, and so I thought, well, I might just do that job, you know. The recruit gets his hair cut military style and marks the first step in his transition from a civilian into a first-class fighting man. And during boot camp, you're not a Marine, you're a boot, and that's the way they put it. It's just the training they put in you, the tremendous skills they teach you, and, and you get proud. Each day it gets harder to work and harder to do it, you get more proud and you do it faster. graduate from boot camp, they say, now you are a Marine, and you are a Marine. I felt very strongly that uh, if I could live in a beautiful country like we live in and have all the rights that we have, that it was also my obligation to defend this country if it need be. With major amphibious operations required on every battlefront, the problem of landing an army on a beach moved to the top of the agenda. A research committee was set up by the American government to investigate new ways of fighting an amphibious war. In 1937, the racing yacht Ranger won the prestigious America's Cup. It was the work of yacht designer Rod Stevens. Early in 1942, he was asked by the Government Research Committee to help develop an amphibious vehicle for the American Army. Yacht design is all about creating elegant and streamlined hull forms that cut through the water at high speed. Now, Stevens would produce one of the slowest and least lovely vessels ever to put to sea. But it would prove to be his most important achievement and a triumph of American ingenuity. Ever try floating a truck across water? It needs a whole platoon of men. A big tarpaulin tucked up over the sides and she's floated across. Rod Stevens knew that obsolete ideas like this were not going to win a modern war. He began designing a seagoing version of the standard American army truck. In 1941, the General Motors Corporation had introduced their two and a half tonner a reliable six-wheel drive truck, which became the universal American supply vehicle throughout the war. GMC would eventually mass produce some 600,000 of these trucks at the rate of one every three minutes. We used to haul coal and stuff on GMC two and a half ton trucks. And they were a workhorse. They were tough. Great engine, six cylinder engine, but tough. On the 30th of April, 1942, Rod Stevens and his tiny group of just four GMC engineers began working night and day, converting a standard GMC chassis 
into an amphibian. They had to create a hull, which would contain the engine and the drivetrain to all six wheels. It needed to be seaworthy, with watertight seals on all bearings. A rudder was needed to steer it in water, and, of course, a propeller to make it go. In just 38 days, they had made it. The new machine was rolled out into the light of day for the first time. The strange beast had no name except its GMC code letters. They were D, indicating 1942, its year of manufacture, U, for amphibian, K, front wheel drive, and W, rear wheel drive. The best that the American GI could make of the unpronounceable DUKW was Duck. And that was the name that stuck. This machine was like nothing the Army had ever seen, and there were plenty who said it would never work. But early tests suggested they were wrong. In and out of the water, the Duck performed well, and hopes were high. The design was cautiously adopted by the Army, but production would be limited to 2,000 units. The Duck may have taken to water, but it soon became obvious that the military establishment had not taken to the Duck. There were no immediate plans to use the amphibians or to increase the order. And as the new machines came off the production line, most went straight into store. Some generals were convinced that the amphibian would always be a compromise, neither a good boat nor a good truck. They believed it could actually become a liability on the battlefield and should not be used in combat zones. War spawns new inventions, and they in turn demand new techniques. But the military mind is quite often conservative, and, and in a way, rightly so, because nobody wants to take a gamble with people's lives. But the problem is this. Nobody will take a new invention seriously until it's been proven in battle but it can't get proven in battle until it's been taken seriously. In a bid to keep the Duck project afloat, Rod Stevens persuaded the army to let him demonstrate its ability in a series of sea trials off the New England coast. It looked like his last chance to sell the idea to an unenthusiastic military establishment. Four days before the trials, a violent storm hit the area. A Coast Guard vessel was wrecked on a sandbar offshore. When all attempts at a rescue had failed, a duck was sent out and managed to save the seven-man crew. A few hours later, the wreck had vanished. Two days later, President Franklin Roosevelt was informed that an army truck had gone to sea and staged the dramatic rescue of a Navy crew. It was the breakthrough that Rod Stevens needed. Suddenly, everybody from the president down thought his machine was a great invention and just what the army needed. The United States Army calls its newest mobile weapon the Duck. Amphibious two and one half ton trucks, they operate on land or in water. Navigating rough seas like Navy barges, the ducks are the last word in mechanized equipment. And who better to take the duck to sea than the Marine Corps? Special duck operating companies were formed, which quickly became known as the Quack Corps, and led to some confusion in the ranks. He says, well, I, d I don't know uh, anything about him, but it's a duck company. And so I, was, uh, I asked him, he says, uh, what the hell is the Marine Corps going to do with ducks? In training schools along the American seaboards, men are learning how to operate and service ducks. Training is tough, but interesting. A driver must be a combination truckman, stevedore, seaman, and mechanic. Once seated in the cab, 
the novice duck driver found himself surrounded by a bewildering array of levers, pedals, dials, and written instructions. It is not difficult. It's put it in gear just like you would a car or truck. There's a lever to pull on your, your propeller to make it go. It was built for whatever you're going to use it for, whether it be land or sea. You didn't have to worry about where you're going. You know you'll get there. But overconfident truck drivers soon found that going to sea was not as easy as they thought. The king of the road could soon find himself out of his depth. My maintenance officer overloaded one of them. He overloaded this one with equipment and tools and whatnot, parts, and it went clear to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> On land, too, the duck driver could find himself in trouble. With the wrong tire pressure, sand is a trap, as this demonstration will clearly show. The duck on the left has tire pressure for road driving, the one on the right for sand. The hard tires make narrow, deep tracks, while the deflated tires splay out like a camel's foot, giving good traction. The driver with the hard tires might have gotten through on level ground, but now he's in a spot with his wheels digging in deep. But the duck had a whole range of special equipment for awkward situations, just like this one. Lesser vehicles might need the help of a tow truck, but the duck could winch itself out of trouble using a ship's anchor, also provided as part of the standard kit. It's just simple engineering when you get down to it. It may seem complicated to some people, but in theory, most of it is simple. What you can't do, this guy can, and that just keeps going. And there's always a way, no matter what. After five weeks of learning to drive, navigate, tie knots, operate winches, handle cargo, and a score of other tasks, the crews were ready to go into combat. I was born and raised in, in the hills of Kentucky. And there, all you saw was a horse and wagon and buggy, and I wasn't too impressed with it either. <laughs> Matters of how we go anywhere. But when I got out of Kentucky, and I could see there is a way, a new world that I never knew was out there. So that's what the duck company and the marine did for me. It showed me a new world. As they set sail for the battlefront, the crews of this novel machine were venturing into the unknown. Rod Stevens felt sure it was a winner. But the duck had not yet proved its ability in combat, and many of the senior military chiefs still doubted if it was up to the job. Some called it a lame duck. Others said it would be a sitting duck and a few predicted it would quickly become a dead duck. Now they would find out who was right. It's become more and more apparent that our strategy from now on in calls for, for landings on lots of beaches and in lots of places. Invasion from the sea. America's fighting a modern war, so it takes the GI truck, adds a little American ingenuity, and you got the duck. The ducks in full production now, and every day more of them show up around the world. In Great Britain, stories began to circulate among the army transport drivers of a strange new breed of vehicle. Deep in the heart of North Wales, there were reported sightings in the narrow country lanes and on the wide deserted beaches of trucks that drove straight into the waves and went out to sea. It sounded like just another wartime rumor. But driver John Geldart soon discovered it was true. They took us out on the shoulders. This is what they call a duck, they said. And we, we thought it was a, a tank or something. It's like, oh. Then we could see the rubber wheels on it, like, oh. What is this, a wagon or some sort, like, oh. And of course, well, this, they told us that it goes out to sea. I couldn't believe it, like, I thought it was a wagon. The first main memory I had is when we first went to town in North Wales for, the, for, for training. And that was the real time when we were introduced to the duck and what I could do, what we had to do. As they examined their new toy, the British drivers found that every compartment and locker seemed to contain some new gadget. Clearly, this was no ordinary army truck. 
But like their American allies, the British soldiers soon adopted the duck and developed an affection and a growing respect for this extraordinary example of Yankee ingenuity. Oh, fantastic, yeah, great. You were king of the road, like, huh? A fantastic invention. It was great. I've got to hand it to the Americans for that. First and foremost, we had to learn seamanship. When we were out at sea, many a time I was seasick, many a time. Most of us were. Tides and currents could play tricks on an unwary driver, particularly when trying to mount the ramp of one of the big tank landing ships known as LSTs. When you placed your front wheels onto the ramp, you'd find that the back, which was still afloat, would be pushed to the left and you'd be facing across the ramp, which is a bad thing to be. But uh, you eventually got to gauge how the current was running, things like that, and enter in such a way that you ended up with your four wheels straight. But to me, it was a marvellous vehicle. It was a pleasure to drive it. The dog's first combat test came with the invasion of Sicily. Now, this was designed to knock Italy out of the war and to do very serious damage to the Germans. And it brought the Allies to the very edge of mainland Europe. It was clear that much would depend not merely on getting troops ashore, but then on keeping them supplied. And this time, the duck was in the spotlight. The Allies planned to mount a two-pronged amphibious attack. The Americans would land in the southwest, and the British would land on the southeast coast. The invasion fleet carried more than 900 ducks to ferry men and supplies ashore. On the 10th of July, 1943, the attack was launched. While some men waded ashore, others had the pleasure of landing in ducks. Their amphibious half-landing craft, half lorry. The landings mostly went well. But another new invention, the big tank landing ships, ran into serious problems. Many beached on sandbars well away from the shore. By evening, the weather was deteriorating and began to threaten the whole operation. But the ducks were able to mount a shuttle service, braving the rough seas to deliver the goods ashore. As the weather improved, the Allies secured the beachhead. But during the critical early days of the invasion, 90% of all supplies came ashore by duck. Some senior officers believed that the ducks had actually saved the entire operation from failure. Considerably easing the supplies problem, the amphibious vehicles, affectionately called ducks, have delivered the goods, as required, all along the east coast advance of the 8th Army. Once safely ashore, the ducks operated as regular army trucks, transporting troops and supplies along the narrow mountain roads. Many Sicilians saw the Allies as liberators, but the Germans put up stiff resistance and the going was tough. At last, they reached the Straits of Messina, and the ducks took to water once more for the short swim to the Italian mainland. The battle for Sicily had been won. The Supreme Allied Commander, General Eisenhower, was profoundly impressed by the ducks' performance. He reported to Washington. Amphibious truck, two and one half ton, commonly called DUKW, has been invaluable suggest commendation for officer responsible for its development. Nobody wanted to admit to Ike that the Army's chief contribution to the duck project had been a determined attempt to sink it. But for Rod Stevens, it was a triumph. His ugly duckling had finally won its spurs. It's not built for beauty. It's built to take the people in, the artillery and the ammo and the stuff we did the sick back to the ship. It's 
anything you want to put on it, you can haul. That's why it was beautiful. With ducks to do the job of getting it ashore, it gets done in a hurry. Invasion's the order of the day. An American skill is right there to meet its requirements. But the duck also had its share of problems. It required constant lubrication and maintenance to resist the destructive combination of salt water and sand. The men are thoroughly grounded in maintenance work, which is highly important in a truck that goes to sea. Every vital part should be serviced at regular intervals. Every day, lubrication is checked and rechecked. The need to stop and increase the tire pressure for road driving after a beach landing was also a major drawback. The crew engages the tire pump using the control in the driver's cab and gets out the air hose. All six tires should register 40 pounds. Inflating and deflating as driving conditions change may take a little time, but it prevents injury to tires and keeps the driver from getting stuck. And in a combat area, that's essential. The answer to the tire pressure problem was an ingenious system of pipes and valves which automatically fed air to the hubs of all six wheels from the compressor on the engine. In the cab, signs told the driver which pressures to use for a whole range of conditions. High pressure for paved highways. Lowest pressure for soft sand. Soon, the duck would be experiencing them all. From the sharp coral spikes and soft volcanic ash of the Pacific Islands, to the firm sand of the Normandy beaches, and the hard road to Berlin. This is the day for which free people long have waited. This is D-Day. At the beginning of June 1944, the Allies prepared to launch Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy. It was the greatest amphibious operation in history. 5,000 vessels, 11,000 aircraft, tanks, trucks, jeeps, and 2,000 ducks. With a mixed cargo, Duck driver Stanley Dobson headed for Juno Beach three hours after the start of the invasion on June the 6th, D-Day. I've been dropped somewhere in the region of three, four miles from the shore. Our ducks were all loaded up with the stores, a little of each. The idea, of course, had been one of the first ducks onto the beach was that we had something for everybody. We had petrol and rations and ammunition, tank shells, things like this. We had a little bit of everything. It was amazing, I think, the organization that went into that. Nobody told you that what it was going to be like when you got there. And uh, I presume if they had told us what was likely to happen, we maybe wouldn't have done what we did, not take the chances and things like that, which some people did. I mean, I remember looking over the, the, the sand dunes at the time they were unloading the duck and I saw the infantry actually fighting to take a cottage. I heard this, what I thought was the sound of bees, and suddenly realised it was uh, machine gun bullets coming up, wasn't over the top. <laughs> I suddenly realised, oh, what am I doing here? Until harbour facilities were established, the ducks formed a vital bridge between the supply ships and the invasion beaches. 40% of all the tonnage brought ashore was carried by duck. The sheer scale of the Normandy operation beggars belief. By the end of D-Day, the Allies had put 130,000 men ashore in Normandy. By the end of June, they'd landed 850,000 men, 150,000 vehicles, and 500,000 tons of supplies. This was a tremendous logistic undertaking. It was rather like trying to supply the population of a very small country or a decent-sized city. 
It was estimated that every fighting man would need up to 30 pounds of fresh supplies every day. A ton for every hundred men, 10 tons for a thousand. Thousands of tons to shift in boxes of every shape and size, each one labeled and listed, checked and signed for. Canned goods, cannons, machine guns, rifles, pistols, ammunition, bombs, hand grenades, mines, mortars, uniforms, clothing, medicine, bandages, ointment, plasma, drugs. Soon the ducks were also performing another vital role. After unloading their cargoes, they became floating ambulances, able to evacuate the wounded straight from the battlefield to the hospital ship in one operation. What the drivers did was pick up anyone on the shore. They'd take him there, get him aboard ship, they'd get him to the sick bay or whatever, and do what they could for him. A lot of people had their legs shot off, a lot of things. For designer Rod Stevens, it had been a long, hard battle persuading the military to adopt the duck. But by now, even the most hidebound commanders had learned to appreciate the value of the floating truck. Its versatility had been proved beyond any doubt, and its lumbering shape became a familiar and welcome sight on every battlefront. You got the feeling you were kind of special because you knew that you were depended on by so many. I and most of the men fell in love with the thing pretty quick because it could just do so many things so well. It's built to, to take the people in, the artillery in. And then now what are we gonna do? We gotta have some ammo, so we gotta go back to the ship, get another load of ammo and bring it back. Now we gotta have food for the men, so we gotta do that. And it, you just constantly go back and forth. That ship is sitting out there full of everything and if they need something heavier, they'll so go get it and that was it. Well, I think as far as the duck's concerned, if they hadn't had the duck, we wouldn't have had Normandy. It's simple as that. I don't think that uh, the Normandy lands would have been successful without them. On June the 12th, six days after the invasion, Prime Minister Winston Churchill became the first of three very important passengers to arrive on the Normandy beaches by duck. Next, it was the turn of France's future president General de Gaulle. For the French nation, his first step onto the newly liberated soil of France remains a truly historic moment. It was hardly a dignified entrance, but thanks to the duck, at least he kept his feet dry. Two days later, the duck again helped to make history. On the 16th of June, just 10 days after the opening of the invasion, his Majesty King George VI paid a visit to the fighting front in Normandy. The King went ashore in one of the now famous amphibious vehicles known as Ducks. The Duck had finally achieved the ultimate status. It really was a vehicle fit for a king. Normandy was another triumph for the amphibians, but it was not their toughest assignment. That would come on the other side of the world, in the Pacific. No great port facilities in the savage jungle lands of the far Pacific, and barrier reefs of coral blocking off 85% of the tropical shores from boat landings. But the ducks can ride over barrier reefs, which suggests how large a part they will play in future operations in this part of the world and elsewhere. Pacific Islands could scarcely have been more different to Normandy beaches. Sometimes there were barrier reefs offshore. This meant that your landing craft couldn't actually get to the beach. And although the Germans always fought very hard, the Japanese fought with unprecedented ferocity. Unwounded prisoners were almost never taken. This was a very different war against a very different enemy. The attack on Saipan 
was launched on June the 15th, 1944. All the ships, as far as we could see, were shelling the land. And it's a sight that you'll never see anywhere else. It, it was beautiful, still it was horrifying, you know. And that's when you're proud of the Navy, because they're blowing those people off that island. And you're just a little man down there, a little duck, and you said, I hope they get them all. <laughs> Shortly after the 1st Infantry had landed on Saipan, the Marine Corps duck crews had the dangerous task of delivering the assault artillery. I think you fear it more when you're on ship. See, I'm going to be there in a few minutes. I got to go out there. And I see what's going on out there. I see those fish jumping out of the water, only they're not fish. They're mortar shells. And I see they're only a few inches apart. And there's millions of them. And I see it's going on all the way from the beach to the ships. Well, the Japs turned loose on us with the rockets and their mortars. And ocean got so rough you could hardly stay in your duck and finally you just weather the storm the ones that don't get knocked out just go on in and that's the way we did it so you hit the beach you're glad to be on sand because <laughs> that ocean gets deep as the Japanese resistance intensified the battle for Saipan grew more bitter and more deadly the Marines suffered heavy casualties. When we went in, you know, the first wave had already been in, and so there were obviously a lot of bodies laying everywhere, you know. I mean, it was it was a, quite a horrifying sight. But uh, that's what war is, I guess. If you hate to see that, people, their arms and head blowing off, and that's hard to take, but you keep going. And then them diesel ships would come in onto the shoreline. And so mixing the smell of the bodies and the diesel, I couldn't stand diesel smell for years after I got out. It was just obnoxious to me. And every time I'd smell it, I'd get the same picture of, of all these fellas laying there. Out of the grime and blood of Saipan emerges America's greatest single victory in the Pacific, control of the Marianas. Saipan cost 15,000 American casualties, but the Jap garrison of 20,000 was virtually wiped out. One Japanese survivor told his captors that it was the sight of the amphibians climbing over the barrier reefs and coming up the beaches, which convinced him that the island was lost. By the start of 1945, the Americans had scored a string of victories in the Pacific. But the attack on Iwo Jima was quite unlike the others. The largest American naval force ever assembled in the Pacific heads for one of Japan's strongest defenses, the island of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is dominated by the dormant volcano Mount Suribachi. The beaches of this desert island are composed not of golden sand, but of soft, black, volcanic ash. Iwo Jima is only 660 miles from Tokyo. The American Marines were ordered to capture the island as a base for air operations against the Japanese mainland. After a heavy naval bombardment, the Marines went in just after 9 a.m. on the 19th of February, 1945. As the first waves landed, there was little opposition, and it looked as if the operation might be fairly easy. But then the Japanese opened up a murderous barrage of crossfire from their well-defended positions, and the Marines were soon suffering heavy casualties. It began to look like another Gallipoli. When the ducks reached the shore, many became stranded, their wheels spinning in the soft ash. That black sand, it was hard to breathe. That was hard on them. And you couldn't walk through it hardly. You couldn't get your vehicles through it hardly. It was tough. 
Only by lowering their tire pressures to a mere five pounds were they able to clamber out at a few points where the beach sloped more gently. All around them, Japanese gunfire kicked up the ash and many machines were knocked out. And then Mount Suribachi standing there looking at you down your throat, and that was tough. It took them three days to get up to the top of that thing. Well, those three days were long and treacherous. Those men laying there just eating bullets as fast as they could. Rockets, and artillery shells, everything the Japs had, they threw them at them. At last, the summit was reached, and the American flag was raised. Iwo Jima had been won, but the experience had left many in a state of numbed shock. 6,821 Americans were dead. Of more than 20,000 Japanese defenders, barely 200 survived to be captured. The suicidal determination of the Japanese and more horrific casualties taking the island of Okinawa convinced the Allies that an invasion of the Japanese mainland would mean slaughter on an unacceptable scale. It was decided to unleash the ultimate weapon. On August the 6th, 1945, an atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. After a second bomb devastated the city of Nagasaki, a Japanese delegation boarded the American battleship Missouri and signed the formal surrender document on the 14th of August, 1945. The war was over at last. The Allied victory was won by military force and mass production. It was won by the fighting machines the tanks, battleships, and bombers, and by the unarmed machines, the transport planes, trucks, and landing craft. It was also won by the ingenuity, imagination, and determination of men like Rod Stevens. These were the qualities which hatched his ugly duckling, which so nearly didn't make it to the battlefield, but managed to prove its critics wrong. Without your ingenuity, where would you be? It's just something that's installed in us. And I think it's great. The duck, great. It was a privilege to drive it and work it. It was, I know it was under awkward times to drive it and use it. But I enjoy this. I don't really know how I would have done it without it, tell you the truth. It was, it was quite a machine. Invasion's the order of the day, and American skill is right there to meet its requirement. So it takes the GI truck, adds a little American ingenuity, and you got the duck. Well, as after the war broke out, I was confused about where I wanted to be, and finally I saw a picture of the Marines in the blue uniform in a drugstore, about normal tall, and I fell in love with the uniform, and that was it. I knew nothing about the Marines, so I went to Louisville, Kentucky, and joined, and they gave me a choice of, of Lejeune, North Carolina, or San Diego, so I took San Diego and been here I stayed there for 18 months, and, and we went overseas, and from there, that's when we got involved with the Ducks. 
and just it was all uh, something I dreamed of. I loved it, every bit of it, and I've never forgotten it since. I had 33 mechanics to keep all these vehicles going, and I'd already spent five years in the automotive business before the war, so I was quite up to date on the mechanics of it. So that's the reason they made me the maintenance sergeant. And so it, there was nothing there that I hadn't already done except just the bilges and stuff that pertains to water. So we loaded, went to, went to uh, back to Pearl again in Westlock, tied up the LSTs and got ready again for Saipan. And during the maneuvers there and setting up, someone was doing some welding on the, the deck of one of the ships and it was loaded with ammo and gas, artillery 105s, and, and this ship blew straight up in the air, human bodies going 200 feet in the air all over the place, then another one blew up. I think we lost four there in just one hour time. It may be that a lot of people never heard of it, but it was there. So a friend of mine was a doctor there, and I asked him after the war how many he had treated. He said he worked 32 hours sticking tubes down the people's throats so they could breathe. He didn't know how many was killed, and, but I know there's quite a few. So after that, it took us a while to get mustered again and take off for Saipan. And our job primar primarily in the duck was to take the 105s in first, set them up. We had big A-frames on the back of every third duck to pick up the artillery guns and set them wherever they wanted them. And the first night on Saipan, we soon I, the, the duck I was in, I guess it was fate, I don't know, but I had the the shear pin broke on the, the rudder. And there's no way with all the waves and the rocks and the Japs firing the rockets at us that we could, you couldn't steer one without the rudders. We tried to bring the ducks in to guide us in, but they couldn't hear us and the waves were too rough. So I had one choice, either crawl in the building and hold it, <laughs> try to reach it and hold it, and which I couldn't breathe in there because the water's coming in so bad. So I crawled out and finally I got the officer standing on the bill, the lid, to hold it down, and I almost suffocated, so I kicked him off. <laughs> but then we're getting close to shore, and when I got, got on shore and went up, up the uh, beach a little ways would be there's a, a road mine right in the center of the road, a little gravel road there, a dust road. So we stopped just in time to miss that, and so we pulled the duck over and unloaded the artillery. And about that time, the Japs took off on us with their artillery and blowing us out of the sea, so we all stayed in the foxhole, about eight of us in one little foxhole that night. No one stood up. We just sat down. <laughs> So uh, that was our first night. One night on Saipan, we were sleeping in, in a little bivouac that the Japs had been using before. And about a dozen of us went in there to sleep one night, and there wound up with about three Japs in there with us. <laughs> when the guys jumped up and said, there's a Jap, there's a, everybody took off after him. We never saw him anymore. <laughs> oh, it, it was it was it was a theory is just just what it's supposed to be. It's not pleasant, but you got to do it, and it, it's just what it is. Well, the night before, they tell you what time you get up at daylight, before daylight, and they feed you real quick. You get aboard your ship down on the bottom deck of the LST, and uh, they. As the whistle goes off, tell everybody to get in your ducks. We go out, we maneuver around the ducks till we all get in position. And there's hundreds of us out there, plus the, the Navy with their other vehicles. And they're, they're timing it. The man that on the ship is timing it with what time did the infantry get in, what time did the other crew get in. And when it's your turn, they say, go, and you just, you're already lined up, you're in maneuver. In the meantime, the Japs are throwing mortar shells at you. It looks like fish jumping out of the water. I mean, they're every foot. And you're sitting there, why haven't they hit me yet? <laughs> so 
And by the time you get started in, there's, it still hasn't let up. It didn't let up one bit. And I was glad to get on land, I'll tell you that, because I, I, I didn't want to swim too much in that ocean. <laughs> too many things falling apart out there. So I thought it'd be great if I just get in, <laughs> in land. Maybe I could jump in a hole if I had to. So, But that, it's, I, I saw nothing that, that I'd say that anybody would pick out as far as someone else doing something more than them or less than them, it was just all in one and one for all, and that's just the way it was. Yes, it's pretty much you've got all these people out in front of you and, and some leaders there to say, follow me and this, and we go in three abreast here, and you've got all your instructions before you start. And like going into Saipan, the, we had all of our ducks out there at one time, getting ready to maneuver and get ready to go in in one wave. And they're loaded with ammo and 105s and personnel. Well, the Japs turned loose on us with the rockets and their mortars and the ocean got so rough you could hardly stay in your ducks. And finally, you just weather the storm, the ones that don't get knocked out, just go on in. And that's the way we did it, so. You hit the beach, you're glad we own sand. Because <laughs> that ocean gets deep. <laughs> so you don't have time to worry about it, though. You just, instinct will carry you through. Not surprised, you just expect it, the way I put it. The only thing you'd expect, uh, I did not expect it to flip that guy over, but when you hit a wave 20 foot high, it'll flip you over. So you just, that's it. So you don't have time to think about it. So you try to avoid the real ones, the real big waves, and if you can't go in on, on an angle, depends on which way the wave's coming in, and kind of float with it. And that's the way you get through most of them. Now, luckily, we never had that many all the time. Seemed like in battle you'd have more because you got a lot of rockets and a lot of vehicles moving, Amtraks and everything else. That ocean is churned all to heck. There's not, not a level spot in it. <laughs> So you pretty much are just bouncing through it. And, but there, there was no, no real fear of turning it over or anything like that. I never feared that at all, so. We all went in the same time, no matter who you were. So you were all hit the beach the same time, the first wave, second wave. The infantry goes in, here comes the artillery. Well, we're hauling the artillery, so we're, we're right behind them. So. I don't think there's anyone wants to do it, but when you get into it, you kind of say, well, I'm in this picture, I'll do the best I can do to get out of it. That's just the way it is. You don't really have time to say, am I afraid? I think you are afraid. I don't think anyone's ever gone in there without being afraid. But you don't have time to dwell on it. You just do your job and keep going and hope that you get up the next morning and do it again. <laughs> and that's the way I looked at it. I believe they they store that in you when you go in the first day. You meet a big buck sergeant there that'll just beat you to death if you frown. And I believe he's already told you you are. You, you're not a Marine yet, but you're going to be able to get through with you, is the way you put it. And during boot camp, you're not a Marine. You're a boot, and that's the way they put it, too. And when you graduate from boot camp, they say, now you are a Marine, and you are a Marine. It's just the training they put in you and the tremendous skills they teach you and and you get proud. Each day it gets harder to work, harder to do it. You get more proud and you do it faster. That's the best thing to tell you. So I enjoyed that part. I loved every minute of it. And even in battle, I didn't mind it. I, no one wants to be shot at, but it's, it's just something part of your job. So you just take it and you do the best you can and hope you come out of it. And that basically is the way you feel. Remember, you, you, you may fear it more before you get out in the duck. I think you fear it more when you're on ship. Say, I'm going to be there in a few minutes. I got to go out there. And I see what's going on out there. I see those fish jumping out of the water, only they're not fish. They're mortar shells. And I see they're only a few inches apart. And there's millions of them. And I see it's going on all the way to, from the beach to the ships. And that's, I think, if you had a fear, I believe it would be there. After you get in the duck, like me, I had a big artillery gun on one side. I mean, I would try to, the ducks was going in, the Japs firing this way, and I tried to stay on this side of the artillery gun. 
get on this side and anything can hit you. On this side, it has to hit the gun first. So you kind of, your instinct will tell you what to do. You're on the same duck, same vehicle, same doing everything, but you, you'll use your instinct where you can and trying to be a hero and stay alive, I stay, get to kill just to be a hero, I don't think that's good judgment. I think they can use you more if you use your common sense and try to stay alive and do your job. And I don't mean that to be a card, I mean not to be a, a jerk. And you know, a lot of people think they're heroes and they're dead heroes. Well, you, dead heroes never helped anyone yet. So you take that any way it comes out. That's the way it is. Uh, how many? I could not tell you. At least a thousand vehicles there going in. Has to be because we had thirty thousand people on there. So you got to have a lot of vehicles to get out there. But you don't have time to count them either. You just know they're all over the ocean and hope they all get in. And lots of wounded on the beach. You hate to see that. People, their arms and heads blowing off, and that's hard to take but you keep going. You don't have a let up or anything else. You just say, I've got to keep going. My job is to do this and I got to keep doing it. And that, I think most of us did it the best we could. The next morning, Sergeant Polad and myself was standing up just to say good morning, we're still alive. You might see in the machine gun fire took off across her. So we hit the deck and we could feel the air going across her shirts. And we jumped in a foxhole then, called about 10 feet. And we were there until 11 o'clock in the morning. The Japs didn't let up shelling us at all. And the, the sand, we were eating sand. It was going from here one foot from us all the morning. Finally, it got up about 11 o'clock, they let up. I think our aircraft knocked them out. Well, <clears throat> we saw our men down on the beach, which was about 50 yards away, so we took off running, and believe it or not, we could not run. We could hardly walk. We were so exhausted. No water, no nothing, that boiling hot sun. So we got back, and everyone on the beach was doing fine. The ducks were still running. We had about five or six knocked out with artillery shells. and So we finally got maneuvered again, and that took us about 30 days on Saipan to keep things going. And there our experience was quite rough on the men that had to do the work. Mine was staying back in the back with the men to keep the vehicles running. But the drivers had to go up where the firing was and that was a little bit rough on them. And luckily they all survived. So, so we came back then to Okinawa and then it was just routine for us because the Army had already moved in and the Marines ahead of us put the Marines to take the, the mountains and the Army to take Naha, the level towns and whatnot. And so we never really, uh, the drivers did, would haul them ammo and whatever, food and whatever, and bring their wounded back. But our, us as maintenance, we were pretty well set on the beach and we had a good place there. And we had 50 gallon drums built around with, with the sand sacks around them, so we were pretty protected. By then, the only thing on Okinawa that was bad, the, the suicide Japs came over, the pilots came over, and they blew our ships out of the ocean. I mean, they just dived right into the ship, into the ship. I think we lost about 60 ships there, not all sunk, but most of them wounded. But the kamikaze pilots are the ones when we get word of them, we shot down 300 of them the first day. But they kept coming day after day, just as fast as they could come. And those they trained those pilots. This is your one-way trip. You're doing it for the Emperor. And they that's the way they did it, too. If they could get through our, our aircraft and our artillery and the guns on the ships, I know I was down below on when one of them hit and the bomb scraped across the top and it, the sound was something out of this world. and <laughs> We tried to go upstairs and they wouldn't let us upstairs. That's worse than being up there where it is. If you want to think fear is fear of being stuck in a hole on the ship where you can't see or do anything and you hear all that noise going on. So that lasted about two weeks, I think, to finally get rid of the kamikazes and it was peaceful then. Just the, the 
Army on Naha got bogged down for a while, and they sent the Marines in and took some of the Army out. A good friend of mine was in there. And so the Marines clean, cleaned it up in three days. But that's not to say the Army never, because they did their job. They hit the heavy load, and our Marines were up in the mountains digging them out in the meantime. And that was the only things I could really pinpoint on Okinawa. My wife's first cousin was there in the Air Force, and he got strafed. A, a grenade went off next to him, but that was just minor stuff. He got a Purple Heart for it and just scratches on his hand. <laughs> I think if there's a disappointment in it, it's when I got home after four years of that, that no one wanted to hear what you've done. No one cared. I think that was the most disheartening thing that ever happened to me. And I never saw felt a soul that wanted to hear a word. We, it's a shame it's that way, but I think they all burned out for all the news and radio and four years of war. And it, it's just the way it is. And But the people like us that came in late, and they didn't care what you did or where you were or anything else. I wrote about six letters home in, in four years. I was not a great letter writer. Some people are. I think Art Wells wrote two a day. <laughs> he loves to write letters, and that's fine. That's his thing. But I never did write too many letters. And you try to tell people today what you did, they don't want to hear it. And it's, it's, it's shocking. The United States Army calls its newest mobile weapon the duck. Amphibious, two and one half ton trucks, they operate on land or in water. Navigating rough seas like Navy barges, the ducks are the last word in mechanized equipment. capable of performing a dozen different operations, the duck has proven itself an efficient weapon against the Axis in Africa and in the South Pacific. Here shown in actual battle zone operations, the ducks are swung from ships, ferrying supplies and equipment from transports to troops on shore. These two-way trucks are capable of carrying invasion forces from shipside right into battle. 